our joy, our gratitude, our praise. We are gathered here today, Lord God, as your people, to offer you our sacrifice of prayer and worship. We come from different walks of life. Some have walked with you for many years. Others are just starting their journey. Some feel strong today, some feel weak. Some are full of joy and others are burdened down with care. But you love each one of us in equal measure. And we love you with all our hearts. Bless our time together. Draw us close to your heart. In Jesus' name, for the Father's glory. Amen. Would you join me in seeing hymn number one in the red book, O Worship the King. First and last verse of number one. Thanks, Pat. 
The question we're asking this morning is, is anything more important than worship? Is anything more important to our Christian lives than going to church? Does anything contribute more to our spiritual growth than worship? For good reason, Hebrews says, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Do you think a pastor should ever skip church? For any reason? The answer is yes. Sometimes a pastor should miss church. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. Not because company has dropped in from out of town. Not because his favorite team is playing on TV or across town. I, I remember one church where I pastored where there were a couple of brothers who were very faithful attenders. But I always knew when the Daytona 500 was on TV. Because they just couldn't miss a live car race. And I don't think the pastor should skip church just because he's on vacation. Though it doesn't always work out. I remember one Sunday morning we were driving across South Dakota. And at about 10 o'clock we pulled into a little village along the interstate. Spot of the church, pulled up. No cars. So we checked the sign. Church didn't start till 11. Okay, if church in South Dakota starts at 11, we don't want to sit in a parking lot for an hour. We'll drive to the next village. So we drove another 50 minutes. Got to the village of Wall, South Dakota. Home of Wall's Drug Store. Which... Uh, in this little village of 500 people, Wall's Drugstore is, I think, the second most popular church attraction in South Dakota, second only to Mount Rushmore. So, book 5 to 11, we pulled off the interstate, and there was a church right there. We pulled in, I don't remember if it was Lutheran or United Methodist, and the parking lot was packed. I said, this is a good sign. Just as I was turning off the key, the church doors opened, and everyone poured out. <laughs> and every other church in the village was the same. I presume because every the only employer in town is the tourist industry. Everybody does church early, so people can get to work from noon to serve the tourists. So we struck out. We didn't get church that Sunday. When should a pastor, or anyone else for that matter, Skip worship. Let's make a list. Number one, a pastor should skip church when he's sick. If he gets COVID or monkeypox or leprosy or any other contagious disease, please stay home and watch online. Number two, we should skip church when a loved one is dying. I got the call at 8.30 on Sunday morning. I was planning on leaving right after church. I'd been told my mother was slipping away. And so I planned on leaving after church. But at 8.30 my sister called and said, if you want to see mom before she's gone, you better leave right now. It was a six hour drive to Napa. So I called up the worship leader and said, Sorry, Phil, but you're on your own today. We're leaving now. Early afternoon when we got to Napanee, I found Pastor Ken, my parents' pastor. He found out when he arrived at church that morning that Mom only had hours to live. And he said to the congregation, I'm not sure what to do. 
I, I want to be here with you, but I, I want to be with the Hartman family too. And the congregation said, Pastor, you go. We, we'll, we'll have a prayer meeting. We'll have a sing song. We'll, we'll do something. You go. And he spent the whole day with my family. That meant so much. So if someone you love is dying in hospital, I don't expect you to see, I don't expect to see you in church. Number three, you, we shouldn't come to church when our house is on fire. I, I, we were just about ready to start the service. I was just coming up onto the platform. To announce the first hymn, when my fire pager went off. It's really loud. I knew we couldn't compete with that. I said, let's just wait a minute, listen to the message, and then we'll begin our service. The dispatcher said it's a structure fire at such and such an address. And there was a gas at the back of the sanctuary. And someone said, but, but that's Wally and Orphe's address. I wondered why they weren't here this morning. I didn't know what to do. I had two commitments. So I said, let's have a short service this morning. So I can go and help. And the congregation said, no, Pastor. You go save Wally and Orphe. Go save their house. We'll take care of things here. Fortunately, when we got there, we found it, it was their garage, not their house. We were able to save their home. But it was important to be there. And if a neighbor of yours has a crisis on a Sunday morning, I expect you will go and help her in the name of Jesus. You have my blessing. Go. I pray that God will use you, that he will work through you, that he will bring healing and grace through your compassion and care for loved ones. There's one other reason why a good follower of Jesus might skip church. We find it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So reason number four to skip church when you have a relationship that needs to be patched up, feel free to skip church to do so. To do as much as you can to make things right. Then come and worship God with a clean heart and a pure conscience. Verse 23 talks about the altar. In Bible times, an altar was a pile of stones on which a person offered a sacrifice to God. All the patriarchs seemed to set up personal altars for sacrificing and worshiping the Lord. Noah did it on Mount Ararat. Abraham did it on Mount Moriah. Jacob did it at Bethel. Even after the tabernacle was built, the prophets and the kings kept building their own altars on special occasions. Samuel at Ramah, Elijah on Mount Carmel, King David on the threshing floor of Ornan. But by Jesus' time, all Jews were expected to go to the tabernacle in Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices to God on the golden altar. Their peace offerings, their thank offerings, their guilt offerings, their sin offerings, their praise offerings. All offered to the Lord God Jehovah. 
on the temple altar. Worshippers would bring their gifts to the priest, and the priest would offer them to God. Most of their offerings, their gifts, were animals or birds, but some were grains or fruit or drinks. The purpose of these offerings was to maintain or to repair or to better one's relationship with God. You know, if, if God has blessed, if God has prospered you, and you haven't thanked him, that's not good for the relationship. So they bring their thank offerings. And if someone has disobeyed the Lord, and they're feeling guilty, the relationship with God is strained. So they bring a, a sin offering. To patch up their relationship with God. So if you come to church to offer thanks or praise to God. Or, or to ask forgiveness. So that your relationship with the Lord can be restored. And there he reminds you that some brother is not happy with you right now. That, that word brother means any family member, any relative, any fellow church member. It can even mean any fellow countryman. So it's pretty broad. If he or she has ought against you, ought simply means has something against you, has anything against you, do everything you can to make it right. To restore your good relationship. So if you or I come to church to worship God. To grow in our relationship with the Lord. And we, we, we remember that someone, anyone, is upset with us. For any reason. Jesus says, leave your animal sacrifice with the priest. Or leave your praise song unsung. Or your prayer unprayed. And go. Make it right. If you possibly can. Verse 24 says the reason. The goal is to be reconciled. To your brother. To your sister. To be reconciled means to bring back into friendship. Or to restore harmony. If we want to be reconciled with God, we must first try to reconcile with each other. The Jews in Jesus' day, they knew that you can't be right with God if you're not right with your neighbors and relatives. All Jews understood that no offering, no sacrifice for sin was effective without first confessing that sin and then restoring your relationship with the one you have offended. You, you might be the offender or the offended one. It doesn't seem to matter. According to Jesus' teaching here. What matters is that a relationship has been harmed. If we are not willing to forgive our friend or our sister-in-law. God will not be eager to forgive us either. Right after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Jesus says... For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if we're getting ready to sing a song of praise, or to pray a prayer of thanksgiving, or to seek forgiveness for some sinful thought or deed, or we're about to put our tithe in the offering plate on Sunday morning, and we remember someone is not happy with us. Jesus says, go. Go. If we are not willing to humble ourselves and admit that we are wrong. If we're not willing to be the first to eat humble pie and ask forgiveness. There's no sense pleading with God for what we want or need from him. 
We can't grow in our relationship with the Lord while harboring ill will toward anyone. In Mark 11, where Jesus is teaching about prayer at the withered fig tree, we read, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. We can't hold a grudge. We can't refuse to forgive and then expect the Lord to forgive us. If anyone has aught against you, or you have aught against anyone, an animal sacrifice as a sin offering for stealing cannot make you right with God. The Jews knew it. Unless the stolen property has been restored, been returned first, and the sin confessed, then the offering is brought to the temple. If we have not done everything humanly possible to fix, to undo, to negate the consequences of our sinful words or actions, how can the Lord continue to bless us. Can anyone hope to find peace with God while being at war with their sister or brother? If someone is upset with you for, I don't know, breaking a promise or spreading gossip about them or being thoughtless or self-centered, if, if anyone is mad at you for, for losing your temper or falsely accusing them of something? If someone is upset because you said something that hurt their feelings or you didn't show up at a family gathering, what do you do? Before you go to church to worship God the next Sunday, Jesus says, go. Go make it right. Whatever it is, don't wait for the neighbor to come to you. Be the first to eat humble pie, the first to admit fault, the, the first to acknowledge that the friendship has been wounded. Even if it wasn't intentional, give back what you borrowed and forgot to return. Make restitution. Seek to live at peace, to live in harmony with all people. As Romans 12 says, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Of course, that applies to women and children, too. Let's just suppose that you picked up a lottery ticket on your neighbor's driveway, and you stuck it in your pocket, and ended up winning $1,000. The poor neighbor, he's beside himself. He can't find that ticket. And then he hears that you were lucky. And he begins to get suspicious. And you start feeling a little bit guilty. So the very next Sunday morning, you put a check for $100 in the offering plate. There. That should take care of everything. Right? God will not bless us. He cannot, as long as we have outstanding relationship issues that need to be addressed. Let's be honest. Sometimes you can do everything humanly possible to make peace with an old friend and fail to be reconciled. Not your fault. If you gave it your best shot, God knows will not be successful in restoring every relationship. But we need to try. And what if that broken relationship, what if that friendship was wounded 5, 10, 20 years ago? What if everybody has just moved on? 
lost touch. Is it ever too late to do the right thing? Go. Try. Whether it was your fault or theirs, I find it's usually both. With a humble heart, call, visit, write. Not to accuse, not to blame, but to listen. To hear their heart, to hear their story, to hear their side, to feel their pain, their loss. Go to, to pray with them, to love them, to care for them, to bless them, and if need be, to apologize. To let go, to forgive, to renew, to allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in your relationship, in everyone's heart. Then God can open the floodgates of heaven and once again pour out His blessing on them, on you, on all. And he can begin to heal our land. And he can begin to revive his church. And he can finish the good work he had already begun in us. Nothing clogs up the channels of God's grace more than unresolved relationships, resentments, ill feelings between brothers and sisters. So go. Do something to fix those relationships and trust that God will go with you. It's amazing what God's grace can accomplish when we go in faith. I, I was just this moment reminded of a story I heard many, many years ago. Papa Campbell was an evangelist. I remember him telling the story of holding revival meetings somewhere in the Ottawa Valley. He didn't specify. And night after night, nothing was happening. He preached his heart out. He prayed long and hard. They were good meetings, but there was no breakthrough. No fire was falling from heaven. And then one day, midweek, one of the elders of the church, a farmer, was out baling hay, trying to get it done in time to get to church for the evening revival meeting. And once again, that old Balaam broke down. He was so frustrated with that old machine. He got off the tractor, went back to the baler, and put the boots to it. Went to the toolbox, got his wrench, and began to beat on that baler. And said some words he would never say in church. And he up, ended up down on his knees beside that baler. Confessing to God the hardness that has crept into his heart. And he came to service that night, a different man. But the bailer was still broken. And he shared his testimony about what happened in the hayfield. And after, the, at the end of the service, at the altar call, one neighbor found their way forward and knelt at an altar of prayer. The next night, the whole back pew of teenagers 
all made their way to the front and recommitted their lives to the Lord. Revival broke out. Heaven came down. You see, sometimes it's just one little thing that stops the blessing from falling, that clogs the channel from God's grace. Let's not allow anything, big or small, to clog the channels of God's grace. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven above, thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiving all our sins when we confessed them to you and repented. Thank you for making us new creations, Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for the good work you are still doing in each one of us. Lord, we want to be more Christ-like. We want to honor you in all that we do and say. Lord, search our hearts again this day. Show us if, if there's any relationships in our lives that are not what they should be, what they could be. Lead us, Lord, in knowing how to reach out in love and do whatever we can to make things right. So that your showers of blessing can fall on our lives, on our homes, on our church, on our nation. We are thine, O oh Lord. We have heard your call. Have thy way in each of our lives. Let nothing stand between us and you. In Christ's name we pray. I invite you to respond to God's word this morning.
hearts. Wash us afresh. Let there be no attitude in us that would hinder the work of your spirit. No selfishness. No hard feelings towards others. Lord, we want to see revival again. We want to dance with joy once again. Lord, we are yours. As we go from this place, you lead us. You show us if there's anything we can do to make things better with anyone. So that we might continue to grow in you and rejoice in you. May your Holy Spirit go with us, empower us, teach us, Use us. May our lives point others to the crucified Christ. In his name.